Good morning. Come on in. Look at all you brave folks. Who cares about the snow, right? Just a few flakes. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, I am Kim Holdem. I am one of the elders here, and I get the joy of doing the opening announcements today. So come on in. Take a seat so you don't miss any of them. Uh, first of all, we do want to welcome Pastor Bob Hentrick. It's pronounced Hentrick. And he's going to be bringing us the word this morning, so grateful to have him here. Uh, shake his hand and say hello. He's a wonderful, he and his wife Angie are very friendly and loving people. Um, you all have newsletters that you opened uh, when you arrived. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I want to point out some important dates. As usual, there's a lot going on at Northminster. We have a lot of Christmas activities and things coming up. So here's some deadlines. Please take note, if you could, the giving tree. We need the gifts back under that tree by December the 5th. Um, God's goodness and gingerbread, the Wednesday night dinner event that's held once a month, that is going to take place on December 6th. If you've never been, it's so much fun. I highly recommend it. It's a great chance to uh, have some fun with friends and grow in your faith. Um, December the 11th, is the deadline to sign up for the kids' Christmas party. And then December 15th and 16th, we do have a musical event called Oh Come All Ye Unfaithful. And those words kind of spoke to me because, man, I fall short. I don't know about you. So I need to hear the word to those of us who are not always perfect because our God is faithful. A um, couple other things. You should have with you uh, the Connect card. And if you could put your name on there and just let us know, um, we are keeping... We would like to uh, keep records of who's here, and we don't want to ever lose track of people. So please, if you could just put your name on that. Uh, if you brought a financial offering, they can go back in the blue buckets at the back of the room. Uh, and the last thing is, just to let you know, uh, Advent starts next week, and you'll notice this beautifully decorated room. It's absolutely stunning when you walk in. Um, beautiful job by those who volunteered and did it. Uh, we have a very unique Advent this year in that Every week will be a different speaker, but all of them are united in talking about the story of, the story of Christ and the story of Christmas. So uh, you'll be getting a letter this week from Session telling you a bit about that um, with all the dates and times, encouraging you to invite people, encouraging you to come every week. All of these speakers are wonderful. Uh, there will also be an update on the transitional pastor search, which has been going very well. So we have some news for you on that front. Uh, the last thing is, if I could invite you to stand for our call to worship. We are the people of God. Maybe you've had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Maybe it was lonely. Uh, maybe you looked out the window this morning and thought, ugh, I hate the winter. Or maybe you were excited. No matter what is going on in the circumstances of our lives, I want to just remind us of what Christ has done for us and that even though it's dark in these dark seasons, he has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So I read from 1 Peter, starting uh, verse, chapter 2, verse 9, and these are the words for everyone who is a follower of Christ. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's praise our God who is so filled with mercy. Let's sing, who breaks the power? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love 
that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you lay down your life that i would be set free oh jesus i sing for all that you've done for me who brings who brings our chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And worthy is the King who conquered the grave. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And worthy is the King who conquered the grave. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And worthy is the King who conquered the grave. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Let's in Christ alone. In Christ alone, the cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. And through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When He shall come with trumpet sound oh may i then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless we stand before the throne faultless we stand before the throne and 
Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love and through that chorus out one more time. Let's sing Christ alone. And Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. You may be seated. And as you're sit, sitting down, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, in a week filled with expressing our thankfulness and our gratitude, we take this time to appreciate you, that you are faithful to us even when we do not always see or have full understanding of the plan you have for our lives. We put our trust in your steady hand. That even in the midst of the chaos that surrounds our lives daily, we are enriched and we are grateful that the winds and waves, no matter how turbulent those seas may be, obey the sound of your voice alone. Lord, we ask forgiveness for the times in our week where we have not lived by your greatest commandments of loving you and loving others. We repent for the times we have spoken with ill will. Forgive us for the times we have chosen our will instead of your will. We are sorry, Lord, not because it gets us anything or anywhere, but we are simply sorry because you love us so much and want to see that love reflected in us. But we don't always reflect that love. So we give you this time of silence to ask for your forgiveness. We lift up today anyone going through difficult medical journeys or those of us who partner with those going through these ups and downs in health. We pray for a renewal of strength, Lord, and for wisdom to impart on doctors and nurses to better take care of those ailing individuals. May your presence become palpable to everyone in those circumstances and your peace reign in our thoughts and minds. And Lord, as the weather turns colder, my heart breaks for those who are unhoused. We ask that you provide opportunities for them to be nourished and safe. We pray for local organizations like the Dream Center or Peoria Rescue Mission or the Esther House, Lord, that those resources they provide are are blessed and anointed. But Lord, stir in our hearts to do big things as well, to extend a hand, to extend a meal, anything. We are your hands and feet, Father. And finally, God, I pray for the conflict that continues to happen around the world, the devastation and destruction caused by human hands weighs heavily on our minds. We pray for an end to violence, that this calamity is broken by your goodness and your faithfulness. You do not fall from your throne, Father. And finally, we pray how your Son has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. 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 Well, I'm going to invite Sasha up, and she's going to lead some of our kiddos in a kid's message. There she is. Hello. Come on, guys. Come on up here. Come on over here. Hello. Okay. Welcome, welcome, you guys. You guys, what holiday did we just celebrate? Thanksgiving. That's right. <clears throat> Well, we're going to talk about that a little bit more this morning, what it means to give thanks. Um, have you guys ever seen a sign that says, keep out? Or maybe it said, do not enter. Yeah, you want to hold that for me? Yeah, you've seen the sign? <laughs> it says, do not enter. You know, <clears throat> what does that mean when you see the sign? Do not uh, you want to go hold there. It? Yeah, that's right. Don't go there. You want to hold it for a second? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, you can't go in that building, or if you're driving, you can't go that way. Um, did you know that there's not a sign on the place where Not God lives? Yeah, or yeah. the dead end. Yes, or a dead end. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, do you know who God is? Who is God? Oh, we don't know who God is? Okay, well, God is holy. That means he's perfect. And that means he doesn't do anything wrong. And you know what? He's the creator. He made you, and he loves you. And he wants you to live in heaven with him someday. And you can have a relationship with him. And, you know, God wants us to come to his home with Thanksgiving. And one of those places that we can, can do that is right here at Northminster Presbyterian Church. Do you want to hold that boy? Thank you. <clears throat> so right here at church, you guys, um, you know, all are welcome. You know, God doesn't have, you know, sometimes we call it God's, God's house, the church. You know, and everyone is welcome. And God wants us to spend time with him by coming to church. And he wants us to read his word, the Bible. He wrote the Bible. That's how we know it is true. And if you open up your Bible to the middle of the Bible, usually you'll open up to the book of Psalms. And Psalms 100, it says, 100 verse 4, it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. No, I have to thank Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to pray right now, okay? All right, so everybody close your eyes. Okay. God, we, we want to say thank you for everything that you've given us today, and thank you for the snow, and we thank you for this church and for everyone that's here, and um, we thank you for your love, and we thank you for inviting us to come into your house, and amen. Okay, you guys may go back to your seats. Thank you for holding that. <laughs> And as the kids make their way back, I invite you to stand and tell your neighbor what is one thing that you like to do during a snowy day. Greet your neighbor. Now I invite you to, let's sing this next song together. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation Now revealed in you are Christ What a beautiful name it is 
What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. And nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. didn't want heaven without us so jesus you brought heaven down my sin was great your love was greater and what could separate us now what a wonderful name it is what a wonderful name it is the Jesus Christ, my King, what a wonderful name it is, and nothing compares to this, what a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus, what a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus.
it's a real privilege to be able to preach for you today. And I think your stage looks absolutely gorgeous. But I got to tell you that uh, up until last Monday, my wife and I were a little more used to palm trees. Um, <laughs> I recently retired and uh, got a vacation in Fort Myers, Florida. So the week that uh, Nick Steer sent me the email was my birthday week, middle of November, asking me to come here today. And it was 88 degrees that day and sunny. If I remember right, I think close to that, I was walking on Sandy Beach. And I think I walked in on some sand this morning, but it just wasn't the same, you know? <laughs> but this is not my first time here at Northminster Presbyterian. I actually did a wedding for a couple from Chillicothe a couple years ago, and this is my second time here, and it's not my first experience with the Presbyterian Church. I grew up my elementary years in a Presbyterian church in a small town in Iowa called Mechanicsville. Anybody here from Iowa, by chance? Okay, you're from Iowa. You happen to know where Mechanicsville is, by chance? You do? Okay, great. It's uh, in between Cedar Rapids and Mechanicsville. Now, my dad was raised Catholic, and my mom grew up in the Lutheran church. So naturally, when we moved to Mechanicsville, we joined the Presbyterian church. <laughs> but, but they didn't plan it that way. The first house that they rented in Mechanicsville before they purchased a home was right across the street from First Presbyterian Church in Mechanicsville. And one day, my mom was working in the house, and there's a knock on the door. She answered the door, and there was this sharp-looking, handsome guy with a neat crew cut, and he introduced himself as George, and my mom thought that he was a vacuum cleaner salesman, so he was ready to send him off. Well, he said, no, I'm not a vacuum cleaner salesman. I am the pastor of the church right across the street. My name is George Gallagher, I'm pastor of First Presbyterian Church. So my mom went to get my dad, and they started talking. My dad served in the Korean conflict in the Navy. George Gallagher served in the Korean conflict in the Navy. My dad received a mechanical engineering degree from Iowa State University. George Gallagher received a mechanical engineering degree from Iowa State University before he went into the ministry. I mean, so naturally, you can imagine what happened. My family was at First Presbyterian Church the very next Sunday, and George and uh, my dad became very, very good friends. In fact, George Gallagher, I just looked at the history of that church, had the longest pastorate of that ministry there at that church for over 100 years. And to this day, he had the longest pastorate. And I praise God for his excellent Bible preaching and the instruction that I got from teachers at that Presbyterian church. So once again, thank you so much for inviting me here today. But I'm not here to talk about the church in Iowa. I'm not here to talk about this church. I'm here to talk about God's church. Because this is not your church. It's not your elders' church. It's not the staff church. It's Jesus' church. He is the one who said, I will build my church. It's the one he instituted over 2,000 years ago. And I want to talk as boldly as I can today about the future and the hope of God's church. So my message today is entitled, The Church Has a Fantastic Future. And here's what I'd love for you to come away with today. I would love for you to be able to walk out of this place with a greater appreciation for God's church. I would love for you to walk out of this place more committed to serve God's church at Northminster Presbyterian than you ever have before. And I would love for you to walk out of here knowing that there is no greater force for good, either now or for eternity, than the church of Jesus Christ. Why? Because the church has a fantastic future. Matthew 16 verses 13 through 18. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, 
You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church of Jesus Christ has a fantastic future because it has the only living Savior and Lord. Verse 16, Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I mentioned we were next to Fort Myers, Florida for our retirement vacation. I recently retired from Chillicothe Christian Church after serving their tremendous ministry uh, for 25 years and three weeks. I've actually been in the ministry for 48 years, just about as long as Angie, my wife, and I have been married. 48 years, we will celebrate our 50th anniversary a year and a half from now. So that's good. Yeah. It, it, it really seems like this last year, 2023, was a tremendous year of decisions for Christ at our church in Chillicothe. We had 19 people come forward for baptism, 13 people come forward for uh, membership, uh, probably the highest number of decisions that we've had in our church since I came there in 1998. And part of our tradition as a church is whenever we have somebody come forward to be baptized or uh, to place membership in our church, we have them repeat this confession that Peter made. And so I'm going to ask you to repeat it with me. All right, I'm going to put it up on the screen. Here it is. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That word Christ is the same word as Messiah because Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah. And when he rose up from the grave on that first Easter, he proved that he is truly Savior and Lord. Now, in the original language, the Greek, uh, the word the is repeated four times. You could translate it this way. You are the Christ, the Son of the God, the living one. So Peter was saying, I know who you are. You were the only Messiah sent to save us, and you were the only Son of God from heaven. And no other religious leader can say that. Confucius had some helpful sayings. Buddha had some interesting ideas. Muhammad was kind to poor people. The Hindu Hare Krishna gods gave George Harrison of the Beatles some hit songs. But listen, Confucius... Buddha, Muhammad, and every other religious leader that's ever lived are in their graves. They all died and stayed dead except for one. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. And the church has a fantastic future when it proclaims him and only him as the Christ, the Son of the living God. See, Jesus can be a pretty popular guy sometimes. I had the chance a couple of years ago to go to the Peoria Civic Center and hear one of my favorite classic rock groups, the Doobie Brothers. Uh, great, great concert. And I, there were a lot of songs and I really wanted to hear them play. And one of the songs, anybody other classic rock fans here? Okay. All right. Jesus is just all right with me. Um, I could sing it for you, Nathan, but I want everybody to stay. So. It, it, it's a decent song. Jesus is just all right. Uh, the chorus says he's a friend of mine. But listen, he's more than a friend. He's more than a good teacher, more than a miracle worker, more than a great example. He is Savior and Lord. My son-in-law, married to our oldest daughter, is the executive director for Alpha uh, which is a worldwide uh, evangelistic organization that is based in London, England. And Nicky Gumbel, who is the founder of the Alpha Course, was once asked, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to God? This is what Nicky said. The answer of the New Testament is an emphatic yes. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He claimed to be the way to God and indeed is the only way. Jesus Christ is both Savior and Lord. 
He's Savior because he has the only power to save us from sin and death. And he's Lord because he is the ruler over everything in this universe. Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul wrote this. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The church of Jesus Christ has a fantastic future because it has the only living Savior and Lord. And that leads me to the next point. The church has a fantastic future because it has the only plan of salvation. Jesus said to Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And Bible scholars all agree that the rock that Jesus refers to is Peter's confession of faith. It's what Peter said on the day of Pentecost when he preached the sermon that launched the church into existence. Acts 2.36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this, that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And you know, maybe I should revise my point to say this. The church has a fantastic future not only because it proclaims that they have the only way of salvation, but only if they proclaim that Jesus is the only way to salvation. Acts 4.12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. See, here's the problem. Pluralism. We live in a very pluralistic society. And parts of that are, are, are good. Diversity is good. The problem with pluralism is when you get to the point where you say, well, my way is, is just as good as your way. You know, we're all on different paths. We're all on different roads. But, you know, we're, we're all going to end up in the same place. And I'm sorry. That's just not true. My favorite illustration of that comes from Dr. Tony Campolo. Uh, Tony Campolo was professor at Eastern College in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And one time, Dr. Campolo was flying back to his college in Philadelphia, and he was sitting next to a man, they were having a conversation about religion. So they were talking about religious things, and the man said, you know what, I, I believe that we're all on different paths, we're all on different roads, different journeys, but, you know, it's okay. We're all going to wind up in the same place. As they were approaching the airport in Philadelphia, they ran into a terrible, horrible thunderstorm. I mean, the worst he'd been in. I mean, it's just terrible, you know, lightning and thunder all around, crashing, the plane heaving up and down, back and forth. It was at that point that Campolo could not resist turning to the man sitting next to him and saying, you know what, I am glad that the pilot of this plane does not share your personal theology. The man says, well, what do you mean? Campolo said, there's a man up in the front of this plane, the pilot. He has headphones on, and he's listening to a man in the control tower. And the man in control tower is saying, come up five degrees, come up five degrees, over, over, up, up. You're on beam. Stay on beam. Campolo said, I'm glad that the pilot of this plane isn't saying, there are many ways to land this airplane. <laughs> there are many ways to approach this runway. No, there is only one way to safety, and there is only one way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the church has a fantastic future when it proclaims that it has the way of salvation in Jesus. The church has a fantastic future because it has the only living Savior and Lord, the only plan of salvation, and finally, because it has the only power to overcome evil. Jesus said, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I would love for this message to be all roses and puppies and sunshine, and good news. But I can't, and I think you know why. 
It's this world that we live in. But you see the news. You know what's happening across the world in Israel and the horrible hostages, torture, uh, killing of women and children, sometimes babies as young as six months old, unspeakable evil that happens in this world. And it's just a microcosm of all the things that happen in this world today. Now, let me just hasten to say this, all right? This is, this is the bonus for the message. Just so that you're not misled by popular prophets who claim to have a hotline into God's timetable, Jesus said emphatically in Matthew 24, no one could presume to know the time of his return. No one knows. Not on Christian TV, not on YouTube, no one knows. But here's what we need to know. That every time we see suffering, war, and injustice in this world, we should know that Jesus is near, just like he said. He's not abandoned his people. He's not given up on his cause in the world. And he will indeed prevail over evil. You see, no evil in the world could prevail against Jesus. And Jesus said even the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Now, i got to admit, I used to misunderstand this verse of Scripture. I used to hear Jesus saying, well, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So I could picture in my mind, here's all the Christians, and we're huddled behind these, these gates, and you know, we're afraid because here's Satan with his big battering ram, Bam! 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 But we're, we're together. As long as we stay together, hold hands, you know, close our eyes, we'll be, we'll be safe from that mean old devil. That's not what the Scripture says. Whose gates are they? They're the gates of hell. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We're the ones with the battering ram. We're the ones with the gospel. We're the ones who break down those gates and free the prisoners of darkness and translate them into the kingdom of light. And the church has a fantastic future when it realizes that we have been given the power by Jesus to overcome evil in this world. But please, listen to me. Listen. That's why we need to do church the Jesus way. And not our merely human way. Let me tell you what I mean. I titled this sermon that the church has a fantastic future, and full disclosure, this is not the first time I've preached this message. Um, I've done it in different forms over the years, and it was really my go-to sermon when, before I came to Chillicothe in 1998, I was serving two years as an admissions uh, representative at a Bible college in Michigan. And because I was an admissions counselor, I was invited to go to a lot of different churches, and I would bring this sermon to them. But I got to tell you, <laughs> there were some times that I kind of had to stretch it a little bit. Some of those churches that I preached this message at were so dysfunctional, so infighting, so angry, troubled. And uh, my son sometimes went with me on those preaching times. And one time he said to me, Dad, at this particular church, listen, you got to be honest with them. The church has a fantastic future. Just not this one. <laughs> but when the church is healthy, when it is functional, when it is united, when it is operating under the lordship of Jesus Christ and the power of Holy Spirit, I believe that there is no force in this earth that is greater than the church of Jesus Christ. Northminster Presbyterian, you are that church. You are. Now, I don't know how many of you have read your church's website uh, page lately, but on your website, you've got a section called Our Beliefs. And I cut out a few of the parts of that, and I want to read them for you. This is from your website page. All right? This is Jesus. People attempted to be good enough for God, but they failed miserably. God had the answer. Send the second person of the Trinity into the world to accomplish what people could not accomplish on their own. We believe that Jesus Christ is both truly God and truly human, and that he died and was raised from the dead and his Savior, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who will one day return and make all things new. Salvation and grace. We affirm that the current state of dysfunction and chaos in the world is the result of human choice for something and anything other than God's heart, and that God offers freedom, 
also referred to as salvation, from this dysfunction and chaos through faith in Jesus Christ alone. God accomplishes this freedom as an act of grace, uh, unmerited favor, and I said all that to get to this last line. Wholeness and love and eternity is available through God's grace coming to us in Jesus. Folks, that is the gospel. That's the good news. Northminster, you are God's church. And if you will do things his way, fulfilling his mission and vision with his power, this church has a fantastic future for his glory. And that power, as your website statement says, only comes from God's grace. Um, the, the last few months before I retired, the last weekend in October from Chillicothe Christian Church, our preaching team was going through the book of Acts. And this is what it says in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 33. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. So where does the power come from? God's grace. And the last line of your belief statement that I just read to you, wholeness and love and eternity is available through God's grace coming to us in Jesus. What's available through God's grace? Wholeness, love, and eternity. When I was invited to come here, I wasn't sure that I knew anybody. But fortunately, I discovered that I did know two people here. One of which was your very talented uh, keyboard player, Mackenzie Hopping. And the reason I know Mackenzie is because a couple years ago, we competed together in a duathlon, which is both cycling and running, just south of Springfield, Illinois. I came in third overall in that duathlon race, and Mackenzie was fourth, 59 seconds behind me. So now every time I go to a duathlon, I remember the fact that she has competed in world championships in Spain. And I know that the next time she shows up, she's going to beat the socks off me. But then she introduced me to her husband, Jake. And I got to shake Jake's hand for the first time today. I've never met him in person, but we've been Facebook friends for uh, a couple years. And we've communicated together. He's invited me on a few cycling rides that I haven't been able to take advantage of yet. But I finally got to meet Jake in person for the first time. Now, some of you may know that besides being a tremendous godly example of a father, he is a bariatric surgeon. And I really need to pronounce that uh, correctly because if you kind of slur the words, it sounds like you're saying he's a barely adequate surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> and that is not the case. He is not barely adequate. I looked up his review on ushealthnews.com, and he has excellent reviews. Um, a bariatric surgeon, that's what uh, Jake is. And what he does primarily is a weight loss treatment for people who are morbidly obese. Um, so you might say, well, Jake does surgery for people so they can lose weight and feel better about themselves. No. It's much deeper than that. This is from CNN. Weight loss surgery reduces the risk of premature death, especially from such obesity-related conditions as cancer, diabetes, and heart disease, according to a new 40-year study of nearly 22,000 people who had bariatric surgery in Utah. Um, statistics say that there is a 16% less mortality rate for people who have bariatric surgery. Jake is not just in the business to make me people feel better about themselves. Jake Hopping is in the life-saving business. But Jake also knows what every other surgeon, every other doctor in the world knows. 
that no matter how successful the treatment, no matter how long they can prolong someone's life by skillful diagnosis, the mortality rate for every patient they treat, yes, the final mortality rate for every human being is 100%. The Bible says we must all die and face the judgment. But listen, if Northminster Presbyterian will stand on the truth that Jesus is the only living Savior and Lord, if you will believe and proclaim that he is the only way of salvation, and when this world gets dark and evil looks like it's taking control and all hell breaks loose, if you will stand strong with Jesus and his gospel, then you're not just in the business of making people feel good. You are in the life-saving business for eternity. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you sent your son Jesus Christ to this earth 2,000 years ago to be our Lord and Savior. We celebrate that at Christmas time. The trees and the lights remind us of that. But in the midst of these trees that are on the stage, Father, is a cross. And that's a reminder that Jesus Christ died to pay the price for our sins, to give us forgiveness and the promise of eternal life. Father, would you bless every member, every elder, every teacher, every staff member of Northminster Presbyterian as they proclaim your gospel this Christmas time and until Jesus comes again. We pray in his name. Amen. I invite you to stand and let's sing together. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, and God almighty. And through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior and I believe in God our Father and I believe in Christ the Son and I believe in the Holy Spirit and our God is three in one I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for I believe in the name of Jesus oh it's only by your name oh Lord and I judge and I defend suffered and crucified forgiveness is in you descended into darkness you rose in glorious life forever seated high and i believe in god our father and i believe in christ the son and i believe in the holy spirit and our god is three in one I believe in the resurrection and that we will rise again for I believe in the name of Jesus and I believe in you oh I believe you rose again and I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. The sing I believe, oh I believe in you. Oh I believe you rose again. Oh I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
And I believe in God our Father. And I believe in Christ the Son. And I believe in the Holy Spirit. And our God is three in one. And I believe in the resurrection. And that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. It's only by your name. It's only by your name, O oh Lord. And I believe in God our Father. And I believe in Christ the Son. And I believe in the Holy Spirit. And our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I'm going to invite Pastor Bob up. He's going to give us our benediction and sending. Father, would you go with your people today as we prepare to celebrate the Christmas season. Father, may we proclaim that the babe of Bethlehem and the cross of Calvary and the resurrection power of Jesus Christ is alive in our hearts. Go with us as we leave this place, Father. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>